Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. Every month, we invite an expert to enlighten us on a topic related to our mission. Because Village TV videotapes these presentations, we can share that expertise with a larger audience. We hope you enjoy today's broadcast. So this evening, I'm delighted to introduce to you Sandra Rosenblum. She was raised in Los Angeles, which means that she understands the attraction that many Southern Californians have for their automobiles. She got her bachelor's and master's and her PhD all at UCLA. So she's very attached. Uh, currently, she is research professor in the Department of Community and Regional Planning at the University of Texas at Austin. We may have some questions about that later. I may want to ask her about the general safety of being, it's something professors worry about, their safety, whether, how does it feel when the kids in your class could be packing a gun? But we'll, we'll leave that for later. Uh, she has been the chair of the executive committee of the Transportation Research Board of the National Academies of Science, which in case you don't know is very prestigious. She has been the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Planning Association. I'm just picking a few of the things this woman has done. She's been a consultant for governments, such as in Australia, Great Britain, and the Netherlands. And she just was a consultant in this room to some of the leaders in this village, to which we are very grateful. Uh, her, public her publications include titles like Providing Transportation Services for the Elderly and the Handicapped. Promoting older driver safety. Here's one I really like. Differences between older female and male drivers in response to safety interventions. And the safety and mobility patterns of older women. So please join me in welcoming Professor Sandra Rosenblum. Well, thank you for a lovely welcome, a lovely dinner, and um, good companionship. You're not going to believe this, but Sandra and I did not coordinate our talks, but in fact, they coordinate very well, because I'm going to return at some point to discussing the range of transportation options you have in the community. Um, I also have to apologize. A number of people have been working all afternoon because something happened to my PowerPoints. They sort of exploded, and when I get near the end, I think they really are going to explode, and I have to, have to do something. I'm not quite sure what. What I want to talk to you about today is sort of an overview of what's happening in the United States. Uh, we're becoming an aging population. Almost every industrial country in the world is. We're a little behind other industrial countries because basically we let in younger immigrants. That's a fact, that's not a political statement. Many other countries do not let in immigrants, and so they become increasingly older. And in the same time, like a lot of other countries, we have become a suburban nation. And even though you, have some, you may have some image from your childhood or from your own experiences, living in high rises in New York or Philadelphia or Boston, in fact, most older people in the United States don't live anything like that. I'm going to talk about briefly the travel patterns of older people. They probably won't surprise you if we're talking about you. I'm also going to talk about something that may explain why there's, so, there's not quite the crowd at this meeting that there often is. Older people don't want to talk about safety. They don't want to talk about crashes. Um, I was once invited to give a lunch talk on at uh, Road Warriors, which is older people who go on trips and stay in college dormitories. Some of you may have done it. And they had a lunch, and usually 80 or 90 people showed up. And my topic was something about safety and older drivers, and seven people showed up. <laughs> and I don't think it was really me, because how could they know me to hate me? But I think they didn't want to address the topic, and I think it's something we do have to address. And I'm not, um, I'm not on the side that everybody has to get off the road. I think we're mature and we have to make decisions about this. But I will say that I'm often, 
I do NPR interviews, I, I talk about these issues, and I often get hate mail. Angry, angry people saying, you don't know what my mother drives like. You, you shouldn't tell her she's out on the road. You should tell her that she can be safe. But in fact, it is, it's just as true of older people as younger people. Some people can be safe and some can't. And it's part of being a mature citizen of, of your community to know when and if you should do something about your driving. And then I'm going to suggest the parameters of what I call a realistic mobility plan. Some of you may have heard the term mobility plan. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, has something they call a mobility plan in which they urge seniors to look at their house. Do you have tripping hazards in your house? What, how do you feel? Look at your drugs. I'm not going to talk about those things, so they clearly support the way I view a, mo a mobility plan. Um, I'm also going to talk differently than a lot of public agencies do. For example, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, called NHTSA, has something called Guideline 13, telling state DOTs what to do about older drivers. And basically their advice is, when they come and take away your driver's license, they should give you a bus schedule. That's not a mobility plan. And it's stupid. It's, it's the wrong time. There are, you, there are so many things you have to consider as you, as you age, as you perhaps encounter difficulties with driving. And I might point out the driving is probably the last skill you lose. People lose the ability to walk sometimes before they lose the ability to drive. So this is all backwards. But I'm going to talk about what I think you can do to be responsible and realistic. And you know what? You don't have to tell anybody about it. I've been interviewing older drivers for most of my career in many countries, from Australia to England to the Netherlands. And what I've learned is that older people don't want to talk about this. They don't want to hear their children. I know, of, personally, I know of stories of people who have disinherited their own children for raising, um, and you're laughing, but it wasn't, it's true. They've disinherited their children for daring to tell them that they should stop driving. But maybe stopping driving is not the realistic mobility plan. Maybe the kinds of things that Sandra talked about, using the resources in your community, and when responsible, and when appropriate, continuing to drive. So that's my view of what a mobility plan is. Well, some of you have heard the term, I'm sure, silver tsunami. All industrial countries in the world are aging very rapidly. The birth rates are going down. Older people are living longer. There's a number of countries in the world that have a negative birth rate, like Italy, which is always surprising to me. Ireland, the Catholic countries have, like that, have a negative birth rate. Um, the Scandinavian countries. And what this, this has real implications for a lot of things in society beyond transportation. So in the United States in 2019, almost 17% of the population were 65 and above. And that was 54 million people. And it marks something historic. It was the first time in US history that there were more older people in the population than kids. And that is really striking. Now, California in 2021 had the highest number of older people in the United States. What do you think the next two states are? Florida, Texas, right. But interestingly, Texas, my state, only 13% of the population are older, but that's almost 4 million people. So there's a difference between percentage of the population and the number, and they're both important. There's a lot of states in the Midwest that have a very high percentage of older people because the young people moved out along with deindustrialization. Now some of that may be coming back. Uh, car industries may be coming back. I think what's interesting is that in just six years, the Department of the U.S. Census says 
There are going to be 86 million seniors defined as people 65 and older. And that's going to be more than one in five people in the population. But it's not going to be evenly distributed. There's going to be a lot of Midwestern states that have a high percentage of older people. There's going to be Florida and Arizona and places where older people are retiring as well as aging in place. And one of the concerns is this changes what's been called the dependency ratio. That is the number of people who, of younger people in the population who are paying money into Social Security and, and other things. And on the personal level, the number of younger people available to provide services for older people. The number of kids who can drive their parents around or provide opportunities when they can't. Uh, when they have mobility issues. <clears throat> the census, the way they count suburbanization, and the census has never been very easy about what they consider a suburb, says that in the last census, three out of four US seniors lived in low density places, suburban or rural places. And it's largely because those older folks aged in place. It's not usually because people moved in, but the folks who are moving to Florida, even the folks who are moving around here, they're not moving to high-rise buildings in downtown Boston or downtown New York or even downtown Los Angeles. They're moving into suburban areas. And you can see this. Older folks are much less likely to move in any given year than our younger people. For example, uh, very young people in their 20s, 40 or 50 percent might move in one year compared to 3% for, for older people. And so that's the so-called aging in place. But of the people who move, two of them move out to a lower density place for everyone who moves into what the census considers a higher density or urban place. So you may see articles in newspapers that talk about folks moving to high-rise condos in downtown Los Angeles the reason that you're hearing about them is they're what the press calls man bites dog story. That is, they're in the paper because they're unusual, not because they're usual. Folks are not doing that. And in fact, it turns out that the way the census does the data, they underestimate how many people are living in low density because because of this uneasy relationship with what they what, what, with what they want to define as a suburb, they use legal city boundaries. So if you moved from a suburb of Phoenix, outside of Phoenix, moved into the city limits of Phoenix, that would count as if you were moving to a more urban place. But if any of you have ever been in Phoenix or Atlanta or Houston, you can be living at really low density. You can have horses and cows and sheep and be within the city limits of these cities. So the way the census does it, they overestimate, even with their projection that 75% that of seniors live at low density, that's too low. And other people, who have, other researchers who have used these, who have, have looked at these, particularly the US Department of Transportation, when you use a metric based on what high density, Less than 1 in 10 seniors today live at anything like an urban density. And clearly you can see why so many older people drive, because they're living in places that don't look like downtown Boston, don't look like downtown Chicago. Not surprisingly then, almost all seniors in America have a driver's license. And Today, there's very few gender differences. Most people hit 65, whether they're a man or a woman, with a driver's license. And even over 80% of people over 80 had a driver's license. And that means that almost one in three drivers on the road today are seniors. And that's not evenly distributed. It's much higher in, in Arizona, in New Mexico, in Florida, in places where older people sometimes go. I think you, a really important fact that 
people often forget is how important walking is to seniors. And it gets more important. It, it accounts for a greater percentage of their trip as they of all their trips as they age. Walking is far more important than the other modes. So in the last National Household Travel Survey, only 1.4, 1 1.5% of all trips seniors took was by transit. And only 2% was by all those other modes we've been talking about. Lyft, Uber, taxis, community buses, all of the kinds of things that Sander mentioned except regular buses still only account for 2% of the trips of seniors. Now, of course, it's different in New York and Boston than it is in Los Angeles and Houston, but that means that if it's higher in Boston than New York, it's lower in Houston and Atlanta and Phoenix. It's, it's almost negligible in some places. Well, now comes the, the safety talk. So if you look only at the, the age of drivers who are involved in what is called a fatal traffic crash, there's lots of different kinds of traffic crashes. A fatal traffic crash is one that, in which somebody dies. Not necessarily the driver, but somebody in a car in that crash died. And what do you see? Are you dangerous? No. no. You'd have to work really, 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 really hard to be as bad as an 18 to 24 year old guy. And so maybe it shouldn't surprise you that a lot of state departments of transportation, including Caltrans, spend their money on kids. But it's a two-edged sword. They spend their safety money on kids because of their involvement in these kinds of crashes, but also because kids are doing it on purpose. Kids are drinking and driving, drugging and driving, not wearing their seatbelt, doing stupid things, deliberately breaking the law. So maybe that can be changed. The trouble is when seniors make a mistake, we're usually not doing it on purpose. We have a lot less control. Seniors are very unlikely to drink and drive, drug and drive, drive without their seatbelt, break the law in any kind of way. So it's a lot harder, if you're not doing something bad, to change it. But this is a different way and a more important way for some folks to look at older drivers. Well, let me give you a talk about this for a minute. This difference between men and women, the orange is men, the blue is women, that has never gone away. So I've been in the business. 50 years, every year the men around me keep saying, well, those women are getting jobs, they're out there, they're not paying attention, they're drinking and driving, they're going to, pretty soon the women are going to catch up with the men. This is only one year, but believe me, it's not happening. Maybe women are getting to be riskier drivers and maybe they're drinking a little bit more, but men keep outpacing them. So. These, these differences between men and women, even though they're narrower at older ages, we haven't seen any proof that, that women are not continuing to be safer drivers than men. So this is crashes by age per mile driven. This is what we call by exposure. And you see the difference. If you're, not, if you're talking about time out on the road, the older you are, the more likely, and the older you are and the more miles you drive, the more likely you are to have a crash. This is all crashes. Well, the blue ones are fatal crashes, the orange ones are, are all crashes, but it's obviously true for both. So this is what worries people. That the eight to zero is the number of crashes by age per, per miles driven. Per mile driven, yeah, right. And deaths. What's running across the bottom is age, so that's increasing age. As, the, as age goes up, the number of deaths per thousand drivers in that age category goes up. Now this is not, none of this is about blame or who's at fault. 
I'm not talking about that at all. Well, sort of when I said the difference between men and women. But this is people dying. So who cares whose fault it is? The older you are, the more likely you are to die in the crash. And the reason is that older people are more frail, particularly older women. Cars are not made to protect women. I bet you didn't know that. They're still not tested. Cars are not tested using female dummies. They're used, they're, uh, no, seriously. This is a serious problem. Neither here nor in Europe are cars, and, and not that this is a concern of older people except for your family, we haven't got a clue what happens in a crash to pregnant women. We have no dummies that, that model pregnant women in a crash. What we use for women is a male dummy 50% smaller. And that's absurd because women are constructed differently. We're constructed differently through our chest and our thorax and our bodies. Cars are designed to protect men in a crash. They're not designed to protect women in a crash. And of course, as men get frailer and women get frailer, that's what you see. Again, this has nothing to do with who's responsible for the crash, but this is the outcome of the crash. And in fact, in crashes in involving older drivers, it is more likely, older people are more likely to die in a crash of comparable severity than younger people, and older women are more likely to die in a crash of comparable severity than older men. And, and these figures have not changed over the years. It is literally impossible for a woman to sit in the safest place in a car because the car isn't designed to, to keep her safe. And if you want a really interesting video on the NHTSA website, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, is a picture of test, test crashes of side airbags. Do you remember when cars had side airbags? And what happens is the women slide under the airbag and get the full impact of the crash. They're dummies, they're not people, thank God. But even watching dummies slide under is pretty staggering. It's pretty hard to take. I wonder if you know this. The most common older driver crashes are actually related to one another. So it's failing to yield the right of way, failing to understand, to surveil what's going on, not picking up what's going on in the environment, and missing, misjudging the speed of oncoming cars and the gap between vehicles. And if you add all that up, it shouldn't surprise you to learn that the most common crash older drivers are in is when they are turning left at an intersection because they misjudge the speed of the oncoming car. But by the way, Who's sitting in the driver's seat and who's sitting in the passenger seat? Eight times out of ten, even if the woman is a driver, if there are a man and a woman in a car, they're both licensed drivers, the woman is in the passenger seat. No wonder 60% of some kinds of fatalities are women passengers. So they can't possibly be responsible for their own crash. Though I know one of you wits is going to say, well, if she wasn't nagging him. <laughs> okay, so what is a realistic and comprehensive mobility plan? It's starting today, now. Not when they take your driver's license away. Not when your kids drive you crazy about stopping driving. Not when you can't afford a car anymore. If you live in this kind of environment, you have to start now on a number of fronts. First of all, you have to commit to being a defensive driver. So I grew up in California, I had to go to driving school, they yelled at us constantly. You have to be a defensive driver. I interview older people all across the world and they say to me, I learned to drive in the army, there's no better in a tank probably, right? 
it doesn't matter how good you are as a driver. Maybe you're a wonderful driver. You are obliged to worry about the other idiots out there. It's your job. And if you don't believe that, consider what's happening with automated vehicles. Do we have any automated vehicles yet? Not really. And they've been promising them for 15 or 20 years. All, <coughs> excuse me. All those smart people, all those Silicon Valley types, cannot predict what idiots do out on the road. One of my favorite YouTube videos is of a woman in a wheelchair chasing a duck in front of an automated vehicle. Honest to God, you go look. Lots of other YouTube videos show a bicyclist going from the right lane to the left lane to make a turn in 100 yards. The kind of crazy, asinine things other drivers and pedestrians will do, you must be prepared for that. If you cannot be prepared for that, if you cannot accept that as your responsibility, you shouldn't be on the road. Because those crazy people are there. It doesn't matter that you're a safer driver than those 18-year-old kids. They're out on the road with you and it's your responsibility to deal with it. That's why we don't have automated vehicles. And an interesting side note is automated vehicles are killing off older pedestrians. Did you know that? It's really, really hard. They can't figure out, because older pedestrians are walking slower, they may stop for a minute. If they're walking the dog, they may stop. These smart engineers can't seem to program the damn car to recognize that that person who's standing still for two minutes is going to start walking again. So you have an obligation to accept the responsibility for being better than a good driver. You have to be a defensive driver. If you're going to keep driving, you should buy the biggest, newest car you can afford. Why? Yeah, absolutely. Why bigger? Because the bigger it is, the better it protects you. There's, the, the proof is overwhelming. Also, newer cars have all that good equipment on them, if you use it. There's a lot of evidence that those backup cameras are saving people's lives. Those backup cameras work. And you can put them on cars, most cars as old as 20 years old. So if you can't afford a new car, don't want one, get a backup camera on it. Go to your dealer or go to an aftermarket and get a backup camera. You will be glad you did when you don't run over somebody in a parking lot. You know how many pedestrians are killed in parking lots? No, you don't because, you know what? We don't count pedestrians who are killed on private property. So we don't know how many pedestrians are hurt or killed in parking lots. But we think it's sizable. Make sure your vehicle is as safe as it can be. I'm a great fan of the CarFit program. Have any of you been through it? No. Free, put on by the National Safety Council and AARP, they will look over your car. They will say things like, you're too low, which happens to women. I know I'm shrinking. We're not high enough. They will tell you what cushions to buy. They'll suggest which aftermarket mirrors to buy. They will go around your car and check your blind spots if your mirrors are... It's a great program. It's free. You just have to sign up. I urge you, go through the CarFit program. What can you lose? Some time. It, it's very, very valuable. It'll, it'll be striking to you how valuable it is. I think... Yeah, this is where something <laughs> terrible happened, yeah. I think there's a Dybbuk in it. There's a devil in my PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, there are in lots and lots of people, AARP, etc., offer in class, the police, depends where you are, 
take an in-class driving course. They're usually free. Sometimes you can lower your insurance by taking them. I have to tell you, there is absolutely no proof that they make you a better driver. But they make you a more confident driver, and especially for women, that's important. You'll learn something. You might learn about new traffic laws. They're usually free. It's worth a couple of hours of your time. Take those courses. In addition, you can pay to take driving courses either from driver trainers. There's, they, they know now that there's a market for seniors. They're not just teaching 17-year-olds. So if you can afford it or save up for it, consider taking a course at a driving school. In Everybody in the business, in the tra traffic safety business, knows the gold standard is in-car training. Get in a car with a trained instructor or an occupational therapist, you will be glad you did. Now you may know some people who had strokes and, and went through these programs. They are extremely valuable. They'll point you, and listen, you don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to tell your wife or your husband. You don't have to tell your kids. I swear that that proving them right is keeping so many people from doing something smart like this. Don't tell them. Go and do it. It's really, really valuable. Check your medications. There's a lot of worry in the medical community about what's called polypharmacy. Most seniors take a lot of drugs, medications, and they can interact. And I'm sorry, I know some of you are doctors, but I don't think a doctor is the best person to talk to about this. I think the pharmacist is the best person to talk to about this. And don't just read the labels, though that's not a bad place to start. Because every drug you get says it constipates you, it gives you diarrhea. It makes you sleepy, it keeps you awake, right? It's every symptom and the reverse. But ask the pharmacist for the long description of the drug that comes. They usually don't give it to you in pharmacies anymore. And there will always be a summary of the studies done on that drug. And it will tell you what percentage of people reported diarrhea versus constipation. And that's usually under 2 or 3%. If you see something that's 10 or 15 or 20 percent of people reported feeling dizzy or feeling lightheaded or losing vision, then you think about it. Think about if that is affecting your driving. And if it possibly is, then talk to your doctor about other drugs. Or maybe not take all your drugs at the same time. Maybe take some in the morning and some in the evening. Of course, always talk to your medical provider. But it is an issue. I should tell you there's some research that shows the polypharmacy has no effect on older drivers, but some of the same researchers that found that then turned around and did other studies and found that it did. And if you think about it logically, it seems like a risk. So know your drugs, know how they impact your driving, see if you can take them at different times to control any uh, negative side effects. This is going to surprise you, but this is especially important for women. If you do not think you're dangerous, if you feel a little insecure, a little unsure, but you do not think you're dangerous, drive more. Not in high-risk situations, but you have to practice. And this is something that, that hurts women a lot. Women are content to be in the passenger seat. Women, women listen to their husbands. There's a, there's a Scandinavian study that shows that a lot of women gave up driving because their husbands kept badgering them, telling them what a bad driver they were. And while any individual Swedish woman could have been a worse driver than her husband, overall I showed you the statistics. It's not very likely that every Swedish or Finnish woman is a worse driver than her husband. So once you stop driving, you lose confidence you, and you don't have the experience you should have. And there's something, a verifiable fact around the world, there's something called the low mileage bias. If you drive under 3,000 miles a year, you are a worse driver than if you drove more. And in fact, 
if we control for this, for driving over or above 3,000 miles, the age effect totally disappears. In other words, driving under 3,000 miles explains why 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds, 45-year-olds, 65-year-olds have more crashes. It's they're not getting enough practice, and it's particularly important for women. Another surprising fact from the research base is that you probably heard that younger people, when they, when they have a provisional license, are not allowed to drive with other teenagers because we have substantial information that that makes worse drivers. We have substantial information that older people driving with other older people are better drivers. And we don't exactly know why, but one hypothesis which I think makes sense is they're helping you navigate. So you're not driving and looking for where to turn. And people, it, it's a shared thing. And so much so that there are a number of studies that show that drivers with Alzheimer's or dementia can be safe drivers if they're driving with somebody who tells them where to turn. Seriously, I'm not joking. So the, if you can share the burden of driving by offloading some of your other tasks, finding the street, looking for whatever, um, you will be a safer driver. Now, this is where Sandra and I did not talk, but it, do this now. Don't wait till you can't drive anymore, or your kids take the car keys away, or you, your doctor reports you, or whatever. Learn about what's going on in your community now because it's a job. Think of all the things Sandra listed, and she knows them because she's got, I assume, years of experience in using them. There aren't really good lists anywhere. There's something called the Area Administration on Aging in Orange County, and in most counties, they, they post it on the website, but you know it's hard to keep those things going, and if you call one of the providers on the website, they're out of business, or. You know, they only take people to congregate meals or to this or to that. You, it's a job to find out what's available in the community. Moreover, you should start to learn how to use them now. Don't wait till they take your driver's license away from you and you're depressed and angry and scared. Start now to learn what's available in your community and how to use those things. And support those options now because if you don't, maybe they won't be here in the future. It's the, you don't always have to drive somewhere. Take the bus. You have a bus here. You have things that you are eligible for. Because I'm going to tell you what will happen when they take your license away. They'll tell you nonsense like you're a bit, you can take the ADA paratransit. You can own those kind of paratransit options are only available for people with disabilities of any age. Losing your driver's license, and it says this on some transit agency websites. The Houston MTA, for example, says this. Losing your driver's license does not mean you're eligible for ADA paratransit. So don't you be thinking that these things are available for you. Find out what's available, support what's there now so they'll be there when you need them. You have a lot of options in your community. Support them, help them, help them be better. If you use them and you find that you've had bad problems, then bring it up with the staff and work with them to discover how to fix it so it's ready for you when you need it. I hear a lot of, of a lot of problems about using Lyft and Uber and some of these things, which I consider very good. They're as close to a car as you're going to get, except for taxis. But I interview people all the time, and this is what they worry about. I don't want to give you uh, my credit card. I'm worried about credit card fraud. I'm worried about being stranded. It's one thing to be picked up at my house. If you don't pick me up, I'm still at my house. 
I found out at the doctor's office, Sandra was telling a story or stories of other people that had other people had shared with her. <laughs> Look, figure out there are ways around all of these. If you don't know how to use phone apps, go to a class, learn how to use a phone app. I didn't know how to use Uber's and Lyft's phone app. Somebody had to show me. It's not that tough, but people saying that to you, like your grandkids, with that sneer, you know. <laughs> There are ways, you know what, if you have a smartphone or access to, to a computer, say at the library, Google it. Google, go on YouTube and Google, how do I do X? And 10,000 YouTubes will come up to tell you how to do it. You don't even have to make yourself look foolish in front of anybody else. The information is all there. But you've got to do that now. You have to overcome your fears. You have to understand these things. Yes, you might have to travel with strangers. There's ways around this. There's a, there are things out there. They're not easy to find, but you have to know about them now. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in your house. And we know that a precipitator of early death is losing your driver's license, particularly among men. Don't let yourself get to that position. Start planning now. And maybe you'll never have to stop driving. And you'll be a safe and responsible and defensive driver, and maybe you won't. And I can't tell you, and nobody can tell you. The doctor can't tell you. So my message to you is, you have to, it's your responsibility to be a good driver, to be a defensive driver. It's your responsibility to put a mobility plan into action, to know what's in your community, and to help support the options that are helping people now so they can help you if your time comes. Thank you. You've talked about a lot of vehicles. You have not mentioned golf carts at all. Yeah, I know you like them here, but um, the feds are worried about them. People, they go really fast and there have been, we don't know because often those crashes aren't reported. I don't know how to be, a, if, if you can be a safe golf cart driver, but keep the speed down, and stay off of public roads. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm interested in e-mobility. Uh, ever since I've been here, I uh, have been a bike rider. I've had, I guess, five e-bikes since I've lived here. And rather than drive a 3,500-pound car from here to Trader Joe's or Mother's, for me, it makes a lot more sense, and so does my orthopedist, to get on my bike and, and go over and pick up something, throw it in a bag in the rear. Of course, our community does nothing to support um, e-bikes or e-mobility, and most recently I've noticed there's a lot more e-trikes that are being available at a very reasonable price. Um, so I wonder if you would comment on the lack of support of legislation. Well, yeah, I think there's overall lack of support for bike, bike and pedestrian paths. And I, here's my political thing on it. Um, there's often an alliance between pedestrian groups and bicycle groups, and I think that's to the detriment of pedestrians because they're not the same people. Um, in, in, in my experience, bicycle, uh, advocates tend to be younger men, not always, I'm not saying always, but, and pedestrian, I was on my city's pedestrian advisory committee, and everybody who wanted to be on that committee, it was because there was some bad intersection in their neighborhood. But the, the bicyclists were organized and professional and comprehensive, and. And sure, they probably joined because there was no good bike lane in their neighborhood, but they quickly understood the gestalt of politics, and the pedestrian advocates don't. And so I think pedestrian advocates lose out in this fight. But I agree there's not, there is, I mean, they go and strike a lane, they put a white stripe down the street, and they call that a bike lane. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous, and people park in it, and people put their garbage cans in it, and, no, I agree with you. There is not enough support, real support, for really good facilities for biking and for pedestrians. Um, 
And there's also a gentleman in the back. Uh, but would you comment about modern cars that have GPS systems? Would I comment about cars with GPS systems? Yeah. Um, I like them. <laughs> um, I don't think we have any evidence one way or another that they cause crashes. I could see they might. You know, the thing is, you know, we uh, I have a destination of Berlin that tells me I wanna, where to turn, what to change lanes. That's a safety factor. Oh, you, you, you think instead of taking your wife along, you just... <laughs> I don't know that we have any data on it, so it, it could go both ways. Because if you're holding one of those damn phones in your hand and you're looking at it, um, I'm not sure that's so useful, so safe. There was a gentleman. Where, where are I'm you? I'm sorry, was there who somebody in the talk? back who hasn't? I'm sorry. I thought I saw somebody. Oh. Anybody have a question? Okay, hold on. You had mentioned the uh, car fit course. Can you find that just on Google? Yeah, I'm sorry. If you don't know how to Google, that's probably the first thing you should learn. Learn how to Google on your phone or on a, a PC at the library. And if you just car go, if you just Google car fit Orange County, a bunch of them will come up. I mean, they you know they weren't doing it in the middle of the pandemic, but the number is coming back up. F C A R F I T. Do you want to yell before? The, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm an optometrist, and so I've counseled a lot of people over the years when I was to practice full time about their capabilities of seeing well enough to drive. Do you have any thoughts about how about the role of health professionals and motor oh, yeah. vehicles agencies in, yeah. in licensing? People? Um, this is a long and interesting story. The medical community, the American Medical Association, has for over 20 years been trying to provide guidelines to doctors on what they can look for in an average office visit. And you can imagine what happened. So there's 94 things you can do to determine if your patient should be driving. The average doctor spends eight minutes with a patient they're not, they don't do it, they won't do it, they can't do it. And so, and here's an, another tidbit, you know that in many states, doctors and other folks are required to report bad drivers. Um, doctors are the worst at doing it. First of all, they don't wanna be doing it. Because in countries from Ireland to Australia, they don't wanna do it because it ruins their relationship with the client, with the patient, they think their patient starts to lie to them. For example, I have a girlfriend who tripped over something, fell, when the ambulance came, they said to her, do you think you passed out? And without thinking, she said, I think so. The next thing she knows, she gets a notice in the mail from Caltrans or from DMV saying, your license is gone because you passed out. What the lesson she got from that is, don't tell the truth when the ambulance shows up. So there's all these problems. It turns out doctors don't use the AMA guidelines because they can't, they won't. They, and it turns out that a lot of the things said in those manuals, there's no proof. There's no research base for what they're claiming. So while we would hope doctors would take a role, and adult children are always begging the doctor, to, they don't want to be the one to lose their inheritance, right? So they're always begging the doctors. And doctors do not want to do it, even in countries where it's mandatory, like Ireland, like Finland. Doctors do not want to do it. Someone had a question here? Uh, if I may uh, just add some information when you suggested that get the biggest car and know the technology. I have an old car, large and big with not a lot of mileage, and I saw a year ago the New York Times had an article about the features you can put on old cars. And I, lo and behold, a mile away from Laguna Woods is an enormous warehouse called Audio Lab. 
audio lab, and I had back cameras put on, sensors put on, blind spots put on. You go there and you tell them what your concern is, and they will tell you what technology is available. Great. And I got to tell you, it's changed my life. I bet. What a great, thank you. What a great idea. I just have a comment. It's not a question, but since I live alone in the village, my family all live out of state. So when they come to visit Gigi, I let them drive, I let myself drive the car. I say, you be the passenger because you're going to have to be the one that says, Mama, you cannot drive anymore. So I make sure the grandkids, my daughters and everything, when they come, I let them, let me drive them around. A nice idea. But it doesn't mean they're right, you know. They could make you so nervous that you... Okay. Well, honesty is not the point. Someone they could make here. you nervous. Uh, um, thank you. This was fantastic, uh, everything that you're teaching us. The only, the only thing that um, kind of was a little bit of a... Uh, an off tone for me was buying a heavy car, which is one thing I would not want to do for environmental reasons, for all sorts of reasons. In addition, with a heavy car, of course, I'm thinking about my own safety. I am not thinking about other people's safety. And, um, and obviously, a pedestrian has a lot bigger chance of dying. So with a lighter e-car, you know, we're still pretty good, don't you think? Yeah, but get on that e-car, all the stuff, the back camera, the side camera, all those things, yeah. Another question? Boy, you're getting a workout, aren't you? Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. And I, Actually, I guess it's two questions. Uh, the first is, uh, I don't know if you were, or what has your research shown about the, the psychological barriers to people giving up their driver's license. We all know people who have driven more longer than they should have. And the other one, I don't, I don't really and know. And they're called men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one deals with public transportation, and I don't know if you have any information on this, but uh, the problem for me taking public transportation has always been, you never know how dependable it is, whether it's going to, I, 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 to me, coming from the Northeast, it's akin to the lights go off after a snowstorm. You spend the rest of your time waiting for them to come back on. You have no control. You have no information. You don't know what's happening. So I just wondered if you've done any research on that. On well, that topic there's too. a bunch of different questions. Um, a, a colleague at uh, USC, Lisa Schweitzer, did a really fascinating study. She looked at 10 years of tweets about 10 different transit agencies. And she found that when transit agencies, and it actually was the Canadian ones, Vancouver and Toronto, when they were honest about the lights going out and the problems, passengers were more accepting. Passengers said, okay, they felt like, you know, things happen and you're, do you're doing right by us. And, and the more advice the tr transit operator gave, tweets and so forth, like, Bus 86 isn't coming, but if you walk two blocks over, you can get bus 87 to where you're going. The, the more responsive the transit agency was, the, the, happier, the less unhappy the people were and the more trusting they were. And as proof of this, in the middle of the 10 years, SEPTA, the Philadelphia Transit Authority, got a whole bunch of people to do nothing but tweet back to people who complained and offer them constructive uh, advice. Like, yeah, the train isn't coming, but if you go up the stairs on this side, there is, buses are running on X Street and you can get to two blocks from where you are. And the tenor of the tweets about SEPTA turned positive. So I think there is a way for transit operators to admit there's some problems, we have a role in, in holding them to the fire. It's a tough business running a transit agency. What are you supposed to do if there's snow on the tracks, right? So if we support them, if we demand service from them, but also support them, I think we will get better transit service. 
And I think there was another question, but I forgot it. What was the other question? The psychological factors of people giving up their Oh, God. There's, there's a hundred studies of that, and they all show that even among women, but particularly among men, it can lead to early death, social isolation, depression. The list is long. It really does physically, medically harm a lot of people. Particularly if you're living in a rural area, for example, I mean, there's no point in talking about public transportation if you're out in rural Pennsylvania. I mean, that's silly. And it, it is very difficult for people, very difficult for people. More so for men, because women tend to have better social networks that support them even when they can't drive. So there's a lot of stuff about it, and it's, none of it's good. None of it's good. And as a, a, an afterthought on that, I, as I said, I've been interviewing folks all over the world, and I was interviewing supposedly drivers in Britain. And a number of older men came to the group, identified themselves as drivers, and then it turns out they didn't have a car, they didn't have a driver's license, they didn't have insurance. It had all been taken away from them. But they still consider, I mean, it's funny, but it isn't they considered themselves to be drivers, and they said they were going to drive sometime in the future. And I did the same study in Tucson, Arizona, found exactly the same thing. Men said they were still drivers, even though they haven't been near the seat of a car, and the driver's seat of a car in 10 years. Okay, I have, a, uh, I have the mic. May I tell my... Phone? Sure. Oh. You have a question? It, well, I just want to say this. In the state of California, Every five years, you got to renew your license, correct? Well, I don't know what the law is in California. Okay, but that, but that is what I, I, I experience. When they reach the age of 70, you take a driver's lessons every five years. Now, that driver's lessons uh, or book only contains the rules and the laws that in the state of California pattern driver wants to do. Nobody ever tests you on on your driving skills. And that's not Either. never. No, you're wrong. No, I have gone down there. No, because you came across as a competent driver. But I will tell you, in California, as in all 50 states in Puerto Rico, if you look to the guy at the desk as if you might have a problem, they will order a driving test for you. Or if someone turns you in, if your kid called them up and said, or your doctor, though that's not very usual, or a law enforcement official reported you, you will have to take a driver's test in California and in most other states. But that doesn't obscure your point that you could be a terrible driver and not be caught. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. The question that I have is, why did they remove speed limit signs from the freeways and driving excessively at least 10 miles an hour more than the 65 we used to have? I have no idea. What caused them to remove these signs? So the only safe way to drive is go at the speed of the traffic so you don't go too slow or too fast. Why did they take them off? Well, in my state, they haven't, so I don't know what California's done. Oh, but in my state, you can go 85 miles an hour on some freeways. Legally, you can go 85 miles an hour out west Texas. Sir, I don't know. Anybody else? Are we quick? I just oh, wanna, Sandra. Yeah. I just want to make one quick uh, comment. I had, uh, uh, my uh, prior to my accident, I had a 20-year-old car, and it was a heavy-duty SUV. And the, uh, the, the other driver that hit me had an SUV as well, but it was a bigger one. And, <laughs> yes. He had a, uh, uh, I'll but anyway, it would have been a lot more damage. And I'm parked in a car, uh, had, mm -hmm. had I had a smaller car, but now, I decided to get a smaller car because I, that's what I could afford, and I wish I could have gotten a heavier, uh, a bigger SUV. And I, I agree with that. Which you well, it's it's statistically true. You're more you're safer in a heavy car. But I accept the um, environmental issues that might be there, and that not everybody can run out and buy a car. <laughs>